I did some family history research um, this week about an ancestor of mine that fought in the Civil War, and I'm excited to show you about it. His name is James Flanders. Uh, he was born in 1812, and this is my relationship to him, my third great-grandfather. Um, he had a son with the same name, and then that son's daughter is Beatrice Flanders, who is my dad's grandmother. His whole life took place in three places, born here, uh, was living in Wisconsin, where he got married and was raising his kids, and then uh, died in Atlanta in 1864. Even though he died in Atlanta, um, he was buried back in Wisconsin, um, and on this website that shows his gravestone, there are these notes um, about the part of the army uh, that he fought in and uh, the dates uh, that he was in the military. And that gives us so much information um, because the Civil War is so well documented. The um, National Park Service has um, a kind of a bio on every um, uh, group. He was in the 17th Regiment of Wisconsin Infantry. Uh, this first um, uh, part talks about which uh, part of the army um, that they were in at which time. And then the, um, uh, the next section uh, lists all the battles that they fought um, and the places that they went uh, and then uh, along with the dates that they were there. Here's a Google map showing um, where they had to march. Um, they mustered in at the end of, uh, very end of March uh, in Milwaukee. Um, went to Cairo, Illinois, Clifton, Tennessee, Huntsville, Alabama, and then Rome and Ackworth, uh, Georgia, as they prepared the invasion uh, of Atlanta. I'm gonna take a couple minutes to show you what um, the uniforms uh, were like for the Union soldiers. And I even know a little bit of detail about what he would have been wearing. Most of the um, uh, pictures that you see of the Civil War soldiers were actually officers. Um, it's just a lot more interesting um, uh, to see the um, insignias and, um, and detail and, uh, and this guy's a cavalry so he has a special kind of hat and, and uh, tools but the um, reality is that most of the soldiers um, were wearing this kind of jacket but didn't have any decoration on them uh, just simple uh, buttons um, this uh, website um, shows that um, each uh, rank of the rank of officers had uh, different chevrons, so you knew uh, what their ranks were. Uh, and then my uh, third great grandfather was just a private, so he wouldn't have had anything. This picture does show that um, uh, the color of the uh, pants they would have had, though, um, they all were really light sky blue like this. Um, and because he was in the infantry, he would have had a, uh, a dark blue uh, stripe down the leg. I think everyone wore uh, um, these kind of boots, um, the kind of stuff you make when you're mass producing uh, hard leather um, to be marched in uh, by uh, uh, half a million men. Hats are also a lot more boring uh, than what you normally see. Um, these little uh, symbols um, and things uh, and different kinds of hats are also something that officers had. Um, a private uh, like he would, uh, like he was, would have just been a totally plain flat hat. Um, except for one detail, um, they started to put symbols um, on the top of their hat to mark uh, which um, brigade they were in, um, so that in the middle of a, the battle you could uh, tell, you know, who was in your brigade and who was in a different brigade. And because we have this detail um, up here, uh, we know that um, he was in the 3rd Brigade of the 3rd Division of the 17th Army Corps um, from April 1864 to November 1864. And we know that um, their insignia um, was this uh, white uh, with blue. So he would have um, a small uh, piece of material um, that would have looked like this, and he would have attached it to the top of his hat. 
Here's a uh, uh, picture to make it a little more real. Although it's black and white, you can see the um, plain hat, uh, the plain wool coat, um, the wool trousers, and then remember what kind of boots he had on. And now uh, let's go back to uh, the distance that they had to march. Um, uh, they would have spent an estimate of 300 hours marching almost a thousand miles um, and it was uh, from the month of April, May, uh, June, and then uh, into fighting in July and August. Can you imagine what that would look, what that would feel like to be wearing heavy wool uh, from, and, and thick leather uh, from the top of your head to the tip of your boots and marching a thousand miles I think another part of his experience that would be uh, more meaningful for us is that most of the time they weren't marching or fighting. They were just actually waiting around, um, spending lots of time with nothing to do, uh, not knowing when the next battle was going to be, uh, having no idea how long the war is going to last. And that reminds me a little bit of the quarantine situation that we're in right now. This is my favorite tweet. Uh, that expresses the uh, same idea. Um, I think the the difficult irony um, is one we can sympathize with that um, he would have had to spend um, an enormous amount of time uh, waiting and uh, wondering how long it's going to take and ultimately that um, being in that situation was exactly what he needed to do for the good of our country. In reality, though, he fortunately didn't have to spend too much time in the military. Uh, and um, what I'll show you is that ultimately he was destined for um, a much more interesting uh, or pivotal part of the battle. Um, so his final date um, was the 11th of September in 1864. And we know from uh, this detail um, figured out by the Park Service um, that he would have been uh, part of the uh, Battle of Atlanta, the Siege of Atlanta in July and August, and then the, um, uh, the Battle of Jonesboro here from August um, 31st to September 1st, uh, and then Lovejoy Station um, from September 2nd to the 6th. And that's an important uh, uh, set of details because the um, Battle of Jonesboro was actually so pivotal uh, uh, for the war. So Sherman, the Union um, general, had been able to cut off the supply lines to the Confederates uh, in the past, but they were able to get them back up online really quickly. And so this time when he was attacking Atlanta, they figured out that there were two train lines, and if they could get both of them, um, then the Confederates would have to pull out of the city completely. And so um, the last train line that they needed to uh, um, that they needed to cut off uh, was in this place called Jonesboro, uh, just outside of Atlanta, and this was um, where the 17th Wisconsin Infantry um, uh, uh, joined in the fight. So to explain um, the battle uh, that he would have been in, I'm going to take a second to explain the structure of the army. Um, so the regiment um, that he was in was part of a brigade, which was part of a division, uh, which was part of a corps. So now when you look at this uh, detailed diagram of the Battle of Jonesboro, um, there's actually a part of it that can make sense. Um, his um, regiment um, was in the 17th Corps and he was in um, Le Leggett's um, uh, uh, division, and he was in Malloy's, or Malloy's um, brigade. Uh, and so he would have been standing uh, somewhere in this area on August 31st, 1864, um, while these other two corps um, from the Union were fighting these two corps uh, from the Confederates um, to try uh, to either protect or attack um, this um, railroad line uh, in Jonesboro 
because if the Union soldiers could cut this one off, now Atlanta had no more supplies for the Confederate soldiers. I added that map to his uh, family search um, uh, record, so it's easy to look at in detail. Um, and when you do, you may notice that um, because uh, his corps um, was up on a hill uh, behind the other two corps that were fighting, um, he probably didn't actually have to engage in the battle. Um, I think that he would have still contributed um, to what happened though, because the two Confederate corps that were fighting, um, when they ultimately retreated, um, they made an important decision not to just pull away uh, and reposition themselves like they had done uh, for, uh, for several weeks of the fighting prior to this battle. Um, they actually decided to completely retreat, pull out of Atlanta uh, and get as far away as they could. Why did they make such a drastic move? I think it could have been because if he spent the whole day fighting and having enough trouble uh, f battling the two corps right in front of you, and the entire time that you're doing that, anytime you look up and see that there's an entire other corps uh, sitting at the top of the hill waiting for you, you're probably going to do more than just uh, reposition yourself. You're going to give up the fight. It's yet another instance where standing around all day uh, can actually contribute to the cause. And imagine what that would have felt like uh, for James Flanders. He was wearing uh, thick uh, wool. Um, he had heavy leather on his head and on his boots. And he was standing up on top of a hill out in the broad sunlight on August 31st in Georgia. He must have been sweating like a pig and having to do that all day and never having even fought. Uh, could have been a little frustrating. Thanks to Wikipedia, we have um, some sense of the importance of this. So when the army captured um, that less railroad track, um, then Hood um, knew that he was cut off completely from supply lines. So he pulled his troops out of, out of um, Atlanta the very next day. And he was so frustrated that they were destroying supply depots, depots as they left to make sure the Union didn't get hold uh, of any of them. And they, um, uh, they set fire to uh, loaded railroad cars with ammunition, which led to a huge fire. And this is actually the fire um, that was portrayed in uh, Gone with the Wind um, when they're trying to get out of it. Also, according to Wikipedia, um, uh, Atlanta um, being taken um, had political repercussions as well. Um, Abraham Lincoln's opponent um, was running on a platform that they were going to offer a truce um, with the Confederate soldiers. Um, but because we had this major victory uh, in Atlanta and because they were burning things as they left, uh, it showed how desperate they were. And so, um, it looked like we were more likely to win the war, uh, which helped Abraham Lincoln uh, get reelected and continue to push for that outcome instead of a compromise. It's kind of sad that um, James Flanders uh, didn't get to see that happen. Um, if you remember the dates that I showed you from his gravestone, uh, he died uh, 11 days later of disease um, while the Union forces occupied Atlanta. And um, that was a big sacrifice for his family as well. Uh, his youngest son, James Ezra Flanders, um, that we were descended through, was only nine years old at the time. What does that mean for us? I think that um, uh, in the first place, it gives a lot more uh, significance to these um, little details, um, the numbers uh, and dates uh, and places um, that are uh, recorded next to his gravestone. He was only in the military for a very short time, um, but it was a pivotal moment um, uh, for the war and for the country. Uh, and uh, he played his part in a pivotal battle um, that I think still has significance today, uh, given um, that we live in a time with a lot of racial tensions. Um, 
uh, it definitely would have been a lot worse if we had um, compromised with the Confederates um, uh, and not, uh, and the Union hadn't won the Civil War. And all of that significance came from uh, one place uh, that he was in for a short time at the end of his life and um, how meaningful uh, that was.